Hello, Space Apps community and NASA enthusiasts. I'm Julie Chamberlain from the Space Apps Global Organizing Team based at NASA headquarters, and I'm pleased to welcome you to another segment of our virtual boot camp. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Kartik Shait, a program scientist in the Science Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters and an ardent supporter of Space Apps. He is an astronomer by training and is involved in some very cool and important projects at NASA. He currently oversees the Cosmic Origins Program, which explores everything in the universe from asteroids and the Kuiper Belt to the first galaxy, galaxies after the epoch of reionization. He also oversees the James Webb Telescope and the Origins Mission Telescope, which if selected would launch in 2035. He recently started a new detail in the Earth Science Division, where he is working with economists to help assess the impact of NASA data on societal benefits. And throughout his career, he has championed diversity and inclusion, founding national and international programs to help bring more underserved and upper underrepresented students to STEM careers. For all of these reasons, uh, we, the Space App team, are extremely lucky to have him as a supporter. He's been a subject matter expert. He's an advisor. So Dr. Shait, thank you so much for being with me here today. Um, You're think, welcome. Thank you. Um, I think we'll have you start off just by telling us a little bit about your experience with Space Apps. OK. Um... I heard about space apps in an earth science division meeting when uh, you all were looking for judges and um, uh, you know I actually didn't know anything about it because uh, even though I've been at NASA for about four and a half years uh, I just I, I think I was just uh, not plugged in and I'm kind of kicking myself because I wish I'd heard about it earlier um, and so I uh, decided to volunteer to be a judge my boss was very serious about saying, well, this counts for astrophysics and not, not earth science, even though you're spending half your time in earth science now. Um, so I think, uh, I think that uh, I was really glad to be able to serve as a, as a judge for the competition last year. Um, I actually ended up judging all the competition while I was on vacation in Hawaii, uh, but it was so much fun. So it didn't, didn't seem like a chore at all. Yeah, we're, we're so glad to have you. And um, we had over 2,000 projects last year. And as people know, we have a whole um, judging process that um, narrows it down to the really top projects. And something I'm always curious with when I talk to NASA subject matter experts who are involved in the review process, I always wonder if there were any ideas or projects that stick out to them afterward. Yeah, I mean, for me, first, I was blown away that people could create such incredible projects just in a few days. You know, I think the whole concept of a team coming together and developing, uh, looking at a problem and kind of taking it all the way through a solution is just mind boggling how, how, how much talent there is out there. Um, and I think it's awesome that most of the teams are uh, really unfettered by any boundaries. So I think they have really inspirational, out of the box ideas. So last uh, time when I looked at some of the projects, I remember there was a team, I think in the Philippines, and they had a project called ATIS or something like that, where you know they were going to use their science data to track mosquito habitats and try to, try to figure out a way to improve the health in their country and save lives. I mean, that's incredible. You know, uh, it's not something that, uh, most scientists uh, working with NASA data for research might immediately think about. So I thought that was really great. I remember another project. Uh, I, I learned a lot. I think that was the most interesting thing is I didn't realize that there were there were these problems that even existed. So for example, you know I've taken a cruise before, so I know that there is no wireless available. But on the other hand, you know we have wireless when we fly. So I never appreciated the fact that we don't have a worldwide uh, internet connectivity uh, on the oceans. That if we can have to use that from ships, it would be really expensive if we had satellites to do it. So the ideas that people came up with on how to build sort of uh, internet uh, network uh, that would span the, the oceans with these floating buoys, I thought that was really cool. Uh, so yeah, just some really, really great ideas. Uh, there was one team that really impressed me. It was just two sisters from India and they had designed an entire mission 
where they design the mission from beginning to end, going to the moon, collecting lunar, lunar samples and bringing it back. Uh, and I was just blown away by their, uh, you know, engineering know how and, and the fact that it was just two of them. And, uh, yeah, really, it, it was it was fascinating. It was fun. Great, thank you. That's wonderful. Yeah, you mentioned um, just participants only having the 48 hours, but despite that, just the very creative solutions. And I know a lot of NASA personnel who are involved in writing these projects really see writing the challenges as a way to get the word out about a certain problem or issue. So it's cool to see that um, even our NASA folks are, are learning from the challenges as well. Um, would there is there any advice that you would give participants based on your experience reviewing the projects? Yeah, I mean, I think the the key thing, you know, I judged the pro projects fairly late in the uh, the, the how the judging is done. So uh, I was judging the finalists, right? So it would be it'd be worthwhile also hearing from judges who judged uh, all the entries as they came in. But from my experience, what distinguished the entries that resonated with me were ones that really were very, very clear uh, in defining the problem they were trying to solve, um, showed how they were using sort of NASA, you know, NASA knowledge or NASA satellites to solve the problem, and really were taking it to the end in the sense that they were showing uh, how this problem could be solved rather than uh, a theory, the best, the best teams also were able to do some kind of prototyping. So they did the idea creation, they did the brainstorming, but then they also were able to do a little bit of prototyping to see if their project would, project could work. Uh, one part of the judging involves us looking at these short YouTube videos, um, and they're very short, and uh, their quality uh, can vary dramatically. Um, so, I'm, I have mixed feelings about that because I think if the video is really, really good, you tend to want to uh, judge that that project well. But it, you're trying, you know, uh, you may not be judging the content; you're judging the quality of how well they made the video. Uh, so I think that's something. If if that is a part of the competition, I would encourage the participants to uh, do a good job at that because that's a fast way to get your information across. To encourage the judges to then go more deeply into the project. So don't ignore it. Don't think, oh, I shouldn't work on the video. Uh, you should absolutely work on the video as well as the, as the rest of the project. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And for everyone out there who's going to be participating in the Space Apps COVID-19 challenge, the, the requirements are going to be a little different for this challenge and we'll see going forward. But it's interesting you mentioned the video because um, that's not required this time um, at the beginning. So, um, but I think your points are still spot on. We've got a spot, um, a part of the submission page where we ask people to demonstrate their solutions, whether it's providing a few slides that show how this actually works, how it would be implemented. Um, they can provide a, a short 30 second video, so they'll still have that opportunity. Um, but I think your points are spot on about really paying attention to uh, the storytelling aspect and the presentation aspect, regardless of the video. Um, so that's a great point. Yeah, if you use slides, it's a great way to try to communicate your um, solution, the problem and the solution to the judges uh, and, the, and the world, uh, because a slide forces you to be concise and to the point. And more so when you make your slides, my advice to the participants would be, try not to fill up more than um, a third to half of your slide with words, because you know words are just not as uh, uh, impactful as a, as a, you know, people say a picture is worth a thousand words. So I would try to capture what you're trying to say in graphically as well as, as well as in succinct words too. Thanks for that. Um, I know we've been getting into the nitty gritty a little bit in terms of um, preparing participants to submit their projects and make a case for themselves, but I want to back out um, for a few minutes and think about uh, how space apps fits into the vision and mission of uh, vision and mission of NASA because you've been 
involved in and exposed to a variety of divisions and initiatives. So how do you see this, um, this yeah. Space Apps initiative fitting into all of that? Yeah, you know, uh, I think that the hackathon model is a fantastic way uh, and fits into the NASA mission really well of exploring uh, the unknown, exploring the universe and trying to find answers to questions that, um, you know, nobody's thought about. Private industry is not thinking about it. We're pushing the frontiers of technology and knowledge. In the science mission directorate, normally when we try to find answers to questions, we issue a solicitation and typically, you know, typically it's universities and professors and centers, uh, sometimes uh, corporations or nonprofits that will put in a proposal that may be as long as 15 pages or longer to say, we will use this money for three years to solve a problem. Well, that, that only uh, gets a small percentage of the world involved in uh, getting their hands on NASA data and converting, you know, extracting the knowledge from it. What, what space apps and, and hackathons like that do is really engage the world in a proactive way in a very different way. It's, uh, it's uh, throwing away the boundaries of what a proposal solicitation call might be. It's engaging people who normally don't want to spend three years necessarily working on a research project. Maybe they will in the future, but it's a great way of bringing a very concentrated effort from a very diverse group of people who normally might not get involved or, or, or in, in a NASA solicitation to look at some of the issues that NASA is looking at. And like I said, you know, some of the problems uh, that I mentioned, the challenges I saw being solved uh, were fantastic. And it's just amazing that people came up with uh, such inspiring creative solutions. And it was because they came from such different backgrounds and different, uh, you know, different, uh, just, a, uh, just such a diverse group of people from around the world plugging in to try to solve a problem. I think that's the strength, right? So for example, for a NASA solicitation, uh, people from foreign countries cannot apply, typically. They cannot get the funding. They might be co-investigators, but they, they won't get the funding from NASA to solve. And Hackathon really just engages everybody. Uh, so I think it's fantastic. It's a great way of uh, really uh, uh, helping NASA uh, in its mission to, to you know, uh, explore new technologies and, and, and do new science. Thank you. That's really interesting to, to hear your perspective on that. Um, and not to keep you too much longer, I'll jump to my last question here. Um, and that's that um, this year you're going to be an advisor of sorts for space apps uh, regarding issues of diversity and inclusion, which I mentioned in your bio you have a history with. Um, and we on the Space Apps team um, already have been working on this for several years and we're looking to focus on it in 2020. And so um, I have just a couple questions around that. One is why is it important to have women, people of color, women of color and in initiatives such as Space Apps? And second, how would you like to see the program evolve in this area? Um, I think that over and over again, in almost every sector, of our population, uh, every sector of uh, industry, uh, academia, we've seen that when you bring a team uh, with diverse and different voices into solving a problem, uh, the end solution is far, far better than if you only had people from the same group analyze a problem. And, and that's because you know diversity of opinion, diversity of background, uh, diversity of thinking, uh, really lends itself to that creative tension that is needed when you're really trying to come up with innovative um, novel solutions that are going to uh, really be uh, revolutionary. And so I think that um, if you don't involve uh, women, you would be leaving out half, more than half of the world's population. <laughs> you know, if you don't involve uh, people of color or people from other countries, then you'd be leaving out an even maybe an even larger chunk of the world in terms of uh, looking at a problem and trying to solve it. So I think that basically you just get an inferior uh, result if you if you if you are going with a, a restrictive or, or a small group of people, you know, that's not diverse. So I think diversity is really important, but I also think more than diversity, uh, it's really important to pay attention to inclusion and equity. So one can check off a box and say, oh, we had a diverse team. But, but it's more important to also make sure that 
those diverse voices are included in the conversation, that they have equitable airtime, that, um, that, that that creative tension is being created, not simply by them being there, that already is a positive step. Um, I'll give you a great example uh, from, from the legal uh, arena. Uh, they did an analysis of cases and, uh, uh, and I forget exactly where, but they compared the conviction rate and the deliberation time of the jury uh, when they had an all white jury versus uh, an all white jury, uh, almost all white jury, but with only one African American member on the jury. And what they found is that juries deliberated longer, they, uh, their conviction rates were not as high, and they were just much more thoughtful. Um, and, and, and this was true even when the African American juror never said a word, but they, they were present. And so we have many examples of this. Uh, one can be do the research in social sciences about, about such uh, examples. Uh, that in the end, having diversity and then having inclusion and equity in your processes may take a little bit longer for you to get to the end. And then maybe that there is pressure when you're doing a 48 hour challenge, but it will get you a better answer. Uh, so I would encourage the teams to really think through that carefully from the beginning saying, what kind of team can I assemble and bring me that, that won't just be people who agree with me, you know, who, who might actually be the skeptic in the room, who might bring a different point of view so that I can really sharpen my solution to this space apps challenge. Uh, and in terms of what do I want to see change in space apps, um, I, think, I think it's a great, I'm really glad you guys are focusing on this. I'm happy to help in any way um, uh, in space apps. I think the key thing is uh, to make sure that uh, not just that our teams are diverse, but uh, that we also emphasize the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the evaluation and the judging process, so that uh, you know we end up uh, evaluating um, all of the submissions that come in from diverse points of view. So I think um, because diversity, inclusion, equity are not easy subjects sometimes to talk about because they there is no uh, absolute right or wrong oftentimes like in physics or mathematics, uh, uh, people tend to want to uh, not lean into that discussion. And sometimes it might be uncomfortable. Uh, and sometimes we're okay not thinking through the end-to-end -end process. And I would say that's, that's what I would encourage space apps to do, is to think from the beginning to the end and ask that question. And we being as inclusive and equitable and, and can we ensure that people from all different backgrounds, from small colleges to big colleges, to the ethnicity, uh, gender, countries, uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. Are we, are, have we made sure that we've, we've reached out and tried to include as many people from as many different groups as possible? So that's what I would say. That's great, thanks. I mean, great questions and things for our team to be thinking about on the global organizing uh, team and some great advice for participants too in terms of putting together their own team. So teams will have a few extra days before the hackathon officially begins to start chatting with other members um, and forming teams. And um, so something for them to be thinking about and especially with an all virtual event, you know, this is the first time we've had an all virtual hackathon. There's really such an opportunity for people to create uh, teams across diverse regions um, they're not all, you know, most of our participants, uh, most of our events happen in physical locations normally. So this gives an interesting opportunity to create new kind of team formations. Um, so that's interesting to think about. Well, I'll just take this opportunity to turn back to those of you watching and um, encourage you to meet um, other subject matter experts from NASA and our partner space agencies on Hackathon Weekend. They're going to be in the chat rooms and available, so you'll get to interact with them. And I can't thank you and um, Dr. Shape for joining me here and being such a part of the Space Apps journey. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for everything you guys do. I, I find it really incredible. And, and uh, I know it's a ton of work, but uh, the solutions that you guys get are amazing and I, I hope some of these uh, you know projects turn into reality at the end where people carry them forward and uh, and really uh, have practical solutions that we, we see employed um, uh, whether it's in science or data data. Yes, that's too that's a great vision. All right. Thank okay, you. Bye. Bye.